All right, so I'd like to thank everyone for coming to the uh, RAL seminar today. Um, we have uh, Professor Emeritus re recently, last, what, few months? About three months. Three months retired. Tian Yugan from the University of Alberta. He is an expert in uh, hydrology, climate change, cryosphere. Uh, he was a lead author on AR6, Working Group 1, as you can see on his title slide. He is currently here on a series visiting fellow uh, grant. Um, so I don't know if you want me to, to hit any other high points. I think it's a really great opportunity for us to get some perspectives on, on climate change and, and how uh, that impacts uh, a lot of different things in the cryosphere and, and hydrosphere. <laughs> Take, yes. yep. Could, could I also add that you wrote one of the very first papers using Vic? Yeah. No, he wrote one of the very first papers using Vic at the University of Washington for a climate change study. Um, Gahn and Lettenmeyer, I think, focusing on California mm -hmm. mostly. But uh, since then, we've all kind of been involved in that same production over many years. So, but you're definitely one of the leaders back then. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andy and Andrew and all of you to give me opportunity to uh, give a presentations on my perspective on multifaceted impact of climate warming to the global hydrosphere and cryosphere. I would uh, divide my talk into essentially four uh, topics. I will give a general introduction on water resources and then the energy balance perspective and then climate change impact water resources and what can we do to reduce the climate change impact given the climate crisis that we have been facing in many parts of the world. So uh, the Earth is called a blue planet because it looks blue uh, from the outer space because the, about 70% of the surface is covered by oceans. So I will give a very brief uh, Overview of the world water resources distribution, surface runoff, snow, and groundwater. So we have a lot of water, about 1.4 billion kilometer cube of water, and one kilometer cube is equal to one trillion liters. So it's a, the two numbers multiplied, so huge numbers. Uh, but about 97.5% of this water is saline water, only 2.5% is fresh water, but out of the 2.5% fresh water, 70% are frozen in polar ice cap, and 29% in groundwater resources, and only 1% of the surface water uh, is found in lakes and rivers, uh, especially in Lake Baikal, the largest freshwater lake in Russia, and the five great lakes uh, in the north eastern part of North America. Uh, and so we don't really have that much of uh, fresh water to go with. So uh, as I said, uh, about 70% of the fresh water is frozen in polar ice cap. And this is the biggest ice sheet, Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, its volume is about 20, almost 25 million kilometer cube. Uh, even though it's melting uh, quite seriously in recent years, it still has the most amount of fresh water in the world, but it's frozen and we cannot use it. Uh, Greenland also has quite a bit of uh, ice, about 2.85 million kilometer cubed. So together, these two ice sheets uh, contain about 70% of the world's fresh water. If these ice sheets were to melt completely, the global sea level will rise about 57 meters, which means to say that a lot of coastal cities will disappear from Earth. Okay, and uh, of course, uh, this ice sheet will not melt overnight. It, it can take a long time to melt, even though it's melting quite fast, especially the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, in contrast, uh, the atmosphere, uh, the atmospheric water vapor that uh, plays a big role in our climate contains very small amount of water. Okay? If 
the water vapor in the atmosphere were to condense to liquid water, only about you only get about 2.5 centimeters of liquid water. Okay, but this tiny amount of uh, water vapor, atmosphere water, plays a big part uh, in our climate and in our energy, and it partitions the, the solar energy and regulate the atmospheric circulations. So in terms of volume, a moist water vapor is about 13,000 km3. Fresh water on Earth's surface is about 3,000 times as much, about 34 million km3. But of course, most of the water comes in the oceans. If the ocean were to spread out uniformly over the Earth's surface, the average depth of the ocean would be 2.8 kilometers. So compare 2.8 kilometers to 2.5 centimeters. You can see the drastic difference in terms of volume of water that's found in different parts of the Earth. Uh, and uh, we have, of course, our annual precipitations, but annual precipitation varies a lot spatially and also in terms of seasons. Uh, look at the map quickly, you can see that uh, in North America, uh, the eastern part uh, has a lot more annual precipitations, some places over 2,000 millimeters, uh, some places has much less precipitations. Uh, in the Canadian prairies where I come from, our annual precipitation is less than 500 millimeters. As you go further north, it could drop down to like 100 or 250 millimeters per year. And uh, if you look at the world surface runoff, you can see a general similar pattern. Some places are very dry, uh, less than 50 millimeters, 50 millimeters of annual runoff per year. Some places like the Amazon rainforest, Southeast Asia may have over 1,000 millimeters of surface runoff per year. Okay, so obviously uh, you're going to run into water shortage problem in some places, especially in drought years. Uh, and let's now look at uh, climate change impact, uh, how it affects our climate. Uh, here is to show you the annual uh, precipitation anomaly uh, in the last 70, 60, 70 years since 1950s based on a set of uh, major climate data produced, for example, by uh, Climate Research Unit of uh, UNICEF East Langa and so on. And you can see that in the last uh, 20 to 30 years, uh, we are getting wetter globally. Eh? But if you look at the Palmer Drought Severity Index, uh, we get an opposite pattern. Uh, in, since the 1990s, we are beginning drier. The Palmer Drought Severity Index has been decreasing, even though uh, precipitation has been increasing. And this has probably has got to do with the impact of climate change, uh, global warming impact, because that would enhance the evaporation process that may offset the increase in precipitation. Uh, so that was a, a brief overview of the world's water resources. Now look at uh, energy balance. So uh, of course, uh, most of our energy comes from the sun, uh, which is a star uh, burning about 5,800 uh, degrees Kelvin, but at a, quite a distance away, about 150 million kilometers away from us. Uh, so the energy that is produced by the sun at that temperature is about 63 million watts per meter square. But because of the distance, the energy that we receive from the sun at the top of the atmosphere works out to be about 1350 watts per meter square, which is more or less the energy we need for life to go on on Earth. Okay, uh, given that the energy we receive from the sun is 1350 or so watts per meter square, and given the distance away, and the fact that Earth has a albedo about 30%, uh, you do a simple calculation, it shows that the annual global average temperature will work out to be about 254 degrees Kelvin, or about minus 19 degrees Celsius. Okay? So if the Earth's global annual average temperature is minus 19 degrees Celsius, we will lie 
be will there be life on Earth? Of course, uh, it will not be life on Earth will not be possible because everything will be frozen. Okay, but the global average temperature is much higher than that. Uh, it's about fifteen degrees Celsius. Okay, so uh, what causes the increase in the global average temperature from minus nineteen to about plus fifteen degrees Celsius? Uh, thanks to the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect of greenhouse gases such as uh, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor that absorb the outgoing long wave radiations that warms up the Earth to a temperature uh, that life on Earth is possible. Okay? And here it shows you uh, at what band, uh, wavelength, where the greenhouse effect is most effective uh, and what greenhouse gases play a role uh, in this greenhouse effect. Uh, but if greenhouse gases concentration keep increasing, uh, we start to face another problem. That's a global warming crisis that we are facing right now because CO2 methane are uh, increasing uh, annually uh, by a certain amount. Okay? Now, uh, right now, the CO2 concentrations uh, in 2020 is about 410 parts per million. Right now, it's probably about 415 parts per million. Okay, and this is probably the highest CO2 concentration that has been seen in the last uh, 650,000 years based on the pedal climate data that, uh, that uh, scientists managed to drill in the Antarctic and the Arctic. And by analyzing the air bubbles trapped in those ice core, they can date back the the, the climate to the last 600,000 years. And based on those uh, results, CO2 concentration in the past has never gone beyond 300 parts per million. Uh, right now it's 400 over. So uh, something is going on. And what causes this? It's probably because of the burning of fossil fuel that has been going on since the Industrial Revolution, since about 1750. And you can also see that in this paleo climate data, there is a certain cycle. Uh, it's about 100,000 year per cycle. And that seems to show that the planetary uh, orbit is, has certain cycle. It's about 100,000 uh, year cycle. That's based on uh, one of those uh, theory that has been postulated in 1930 by a scientist. So uh, I'll now move on to talk about uh, uh, greenhouse effect of CO2 methane nitrous oxide. Uh, I will just uh, briefly uh, mention the fact that uh, we consume shared resources, air, fresh water, and return the waste back to the shared resources, land, ocean, and air. Uh, we benefit from shared resources, but distribute the cost across anyone who also uses the resources. And the problem we are facing is the fact that we sometimes fail to recognize the consumptive activities of some could lead to a single impact of many. The destruction of the integrity of shared resources, such as the overfishing of the oceans, the cutting down of Amazon rainforests, and all those climate crises we are facing right now is attributed to the global warming impact uh, due to the activities uh, of uh, mankind. So what is climate change? Uh, that is based on the IPCC report, the latest report published in 2011. Climate change refers to a change in the state of climate that can be identified by the change of its uh, key properties as the mean or the standard deviations. And it lasts for an extended period of time, could be a few years, could be decades or longer. Okay, So uh, it could be due to some natural processes uh, such as a volcanic eruption somewhere or such as uh, the solar cycles, but it's more likely due to the persistent anthropogenic changes of the composition and atmosphere in the land or due to uh, land use impact like, like uh, deforestations, uh, urbanization and so on. So uh, I will now uh, mention a bit about the IPCC report. IPCC stands for Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. Uh, it has uh, published six assessment reports uh, over a period of about 30 years since early 1990. And in each report, IPCC initially was quite cautious in blaming the observed increase in temperature could be due to uh, 
effect uh, due to the, the, the impact of men's activities. Uh, but in subsequent report from the first, second, third and fourth report, uh, IPPC become more woke and more assertive that uh, the warming that we have been observing since the last 50 years or so is attributable to human activities. In the fourth assessment report, it, it says it's very likely uh, observed increase in temperature is due to employment. In the fifth assessment, it says it's extremely likely. And in the sixth assessment report, the latest it says it's indisputable. Now you cannot dispute against the fact that uh, we are the one uh, that have contributed to all this observed warming uh, since the uh, mid 20th century. Okay, so this was one of those uh, IPCC uh, lead orders meeting that took place. The, the one in Toulouse, France, just before the pandemic began in early 2020. And these are some of the key uh, statements. Uh, that uh, IPCC latest report has published. Uh, recent changes in climate are widespread, rapid, intensifying, and unprecedented in thousands of years. And we cannot dispute human activities are causing all this climate change, making extreme climate events, heat waves, heavy rainfall, droughts more frequent and more severe. And uh, however, some changes could be slowed down, some could be stopped by limiting warming, by limiting uh, the emission of CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases uh, very quickly and in a very sustained, uh, significant level. And otherwise, uh, we cannot quite anticipate the consequences of climate change that will impact us in years to come. We talk about 2050s, some of us don't worry too much, especially myself, I will probably not be around long before that, uh, but the younger generation will be impacted by this climate change impact. So uh, just a few slides about uh, the latest report. It, it clearly shows that uh, based on the observed temperature, uh, temperature has been rising quickly since the mid 20th century. And that has been authenticated by the effect of uh, greenhouse gases because climate models uh, uh, driven with all this greenhouse gas uh, input simulate very similar uh, increasing trend. And if this uh, climate model were to be driven without those greenhouse gases, it produced a very different uh, scenario uh, than without all this uh, warming trend that we have observed in, since the mid 20th century. Okay? And, uh, and, and these are the various uh, different emissions uh, from human activities uh, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and so on, they have contributed to climate change impact. Now, the observed warming uh, relative to 1850 and 1900 uh, is about 1.1 degrees Celsius. That is partly because of the cooling effect of aerosols, uh, the, the pollutants in the air that have some cooling effect that suppress the warming from which will be about 1.5 degrees Celsius if you the cooling effect to about 1.1 degrees Celsius until now. And if you look at the projections, uh, compare the fourth assessment report and the fifth assessment report, the SRES, that's the fourth assessment report, uh, RCB is the fifth assessment report, you can see that uh, the, the projection is getting, going to be more widespread and based on the projections, based on the most uh, severe projection, the RCB 8.5 in the fifth assembly report, uh, CO2 concentration can rise to like over 900 parts per million by the end of the 21st century if, if life were to go on as, without any kind of uh, consideration of the environment protections. And if you compare, uh, the warming trend versus the increase in the CO2, you can see that there is a fairly near relationship. Uh, that as CO2 concentration going up, the warming trend also go up, and in a fairly, uh, you know, very fairly linear fashions. Okay, so uh, if we can limit our uh, climate warming to those more optimistic scenario, then we can limit the warming to a 
let's say, by about 1.5 degrees Celsius at the end of the 21st century. Otherwise, that will be beyond reach. And of course, you heard about the meeting in COP26, COP27, that uh, world leaders uh, are talking about targeting uh, the 1.5 degrees Celsius to be our upper limit in global warming. Okay, and if, if we can achieve net zero emissions by 2050s, if we can able to uh, follow the most optimistic uh, SSP projection, SSP stands for Shared Social Economic Pathway, uh, otherwise, uh, we will not be able to achieve that. And right now, based on my understanding, we are more somewhere here, SSP 2495, or maybe a bit higher. So uh, we may not be able to achieve net zero emission unless we can bring everything down to the most optimistic uh, projections. So here shows you compare uh, uh, the global surface temperature projections uh, for different emission scenarios, okay? So as I said, the most optimistic is the SSP1 1.9, then SSP1 2.6, and so on. But I would think that based on what we are emitting right now, we are more somewhere here, okay? So uh, if that were the case, uh, temperature could rise by two to three degrees Celsius by the end of 21st century, based on this climate model projections. And the northern latitude areas will be impacted most because uh, of the uneven warming trend that has been observed and that has been simulated by climate models. So uh, you probably heard of the term Arctic amplification. Arctic is warming much faster than the global average. And it has been observed uh, in recent years, and also it has been simulated by climate models. So if you limit to one degree Celsius of global warming, I think we're warming higher uh, by two to three degrees Celsius. And otherwise, uh, if you not, if you limit the global warming to two, two degrees Celsius, I think could warm up by four or five degrees Celsius by the end of the 21st century. And associated with the warming uh, impact, precipitation is expected to increase, especially in high latitude areas and some part of the tropics. And it could decrease in other areas. So there could be more drought in some part of the world, uh, but more flooding problems in other parts of the world. Okay? So if you limit the global warming 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, precipitation in the high Arctic area could increase by 20 to 30 uh, percent, but some places could have some driving impact, uh, effect of drying, uh, about decrease of precipitation by 10 percent or higher. Okay, so uh, because of this complex uh, picture, we can see that the global warming impact can be quite complicated. It depends where you are located. And associated with all these changes, the warming and the change in humidity, uh, precipitations, and so on, uh, uh, IPCC managed to uh, group the regions across the world into five clusters. Some places will experience hotter and drier climate. Some could experience hotter but wetter extremes. Okay? So it depends where you are located. Uh, so if you are in western part of US and Canada, uh, you probably going to uh, expect hotter but drier climate. Okay. Some may be a bit wetter, but a large part is going to be uh, hotter and wetter climate. And some uh, have going to experience more extreme precipitations, uh, and also some could have more severe tropical cyclones, uh, hurricanes, and severe wind, and so on. So wet and dry. It depends on where you're located. Uh, that's how global water cycle is going to be driven by the radiative forcing from uh, increasing CO2 and methane and other greenhouse gas concentrations. Okay, and uh, we expect uh, in general uh, there's going to be more uh, wetter climate because of the fact that atmospheric water 
holding capacity increases by about 7% per degree Celsius warming, uh, which is commonly known as uh, the Clausius uh, clay pyro uh, scaling uh, or the relationship. Okay? Uh, so flooding uh, is going to expect to increase depending on which scenarios that you you believe in, uh, flooding could increase by 2.4% based on the SSP 11.9 scenario, that the most optimistic scenarios uh, could be by 8.3% if you think that SSP 8.5 scenarios were to dominate the future uh, climate in years to come. Okay, Now, this number, 1.5, means to say one, the radiative forcing of increasing greenhouse gases is about 1.9 watts per meter square in SSP5, 8.5. The radiative forcing is about 8.5 watts per meter square. Okay? Now, but uh, because of warming, uh, atmospheric evaporative demand will also subject, will also increase, and that could cause some severe droughts in some parts of the world. Okay? So, uh, and also, uh, all this warming could alter some atmospheric circulation patterns and uh, increase the contrast between wet and dry seasons. Uh, Detailed pollution increase in northern latitudes uh, are more prominent compared to the mid-latitude areas. Okay. And of course, all these variability extremes uh, are complicated by climate patterns such as ENSO, El Nino, Southern Oscillation, which are also projected to increase by the late 21st century because of warming. And also the impact of land use change, uh, irrigations, uh, deforestation, urbanization, and groundwater depletion, all of these uh, add into more complication to what we're going to expect uh, in terms of future water resources in many parts of the world. Uh, here I show you a, a picture. I like to say this because uh, this looks like an ice hockey stick. And uh, Canada uh, is big in ice hockey and so in some part of the US. Uh, okay. uh, but this is not really an ice hockey stick, even though it looks like one. It's a paleoclimate data, they better last 1,000 years. And the last 150 years or so, there's a sharp rise in the climate. Uh, and, uh, normally uh, because of global warming impact. And if you look at uh, a few more pictures about changes of uh, uh, temperature with respect to latitudes and years since the 1960s, you can see that the Arctic is warming much faster than the global average. Okay? And both pictures show you that. Uh, as you go to high latitude, the warming is a lot more amplified compared to the mid or, or the tropics. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, this, is based on reanalysis data of NCAR, okay, NSEM NCAR reanalysis data, the annual temperature uh, date back uh, between 1950 to 2022, and you can see that the warming trend in the high Arctic uh, could be over 3 degrees Celsius. Okay? Uh, the global average is about 0.5 to 1 degree Celsius. And also, uh, winter seasons, uh, you can see that uh, the warming trend is much higher in the Arctic, uh, whereas in the mid uh, and the equatorial area is much more modest. But in the summer seasons, the warming is much higher in the southern latitudes. Okay. Also, it depends on seasons, right? So, one more picture about all these changes of greenhouse gases, uh, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and you can see the rising trend in the last 200 years or so since the beginning of industrial revolutions. Okay? So, CO2 in terms of parts per million, uh, methane, nitrous in terms of parts per billion, and, but they are all rising. All these three key greenhouse gases are rising uh, concurrently uh, in the last 200 years. Now, uh, I think this is a very nice picture. Uh, I always like to show this, uh, to show you the fact that the temperature anomaly at global scale uh, uh, compared to the CO2 concentrations uh, that has been measured uh, since the, eight, uh, the late 
1800th century. And you can see that there's a very strong relationship, not directly linear, but you can see that uh, since the mid-1950s, uh, we are going above uh, uh, the climate anomaly of zero degrees Celsius uh, when we talk about uh, the climate normal period. Okay? And you can see that uh, there's a strong relationship between uh, temperature anomaly and CO2 concentration in parts per million. And right now, as I say, it's over 400 parts per million. Uh, not that long ago, uh, about 19, late 1950s, it was only like 320 parts per million. And what causes the CO2 concentration to keep increasing? Just look at a simple uh, global carbon cycle. Uh, annually, uh, due to fossil fuel burning and land use change, we emit about 8.5 gigaton of carbon per year to the atmosphere. Of that, about 5.3 gigaton are absorbed by the land uptake and by the oceans, which means to say that from 8.5, we take away 5.3, there's about 3.2 gigaton of carbon remain in the atmosphere, about 40%. And every year, uh, there's a net gain of carbon and moisture, and that's why CO2 concentration keep increasing. Okay? And because of that, there have been various types of unprecedented changes in the emotion, ocean, land, and ice. Okay? For example, uh, fastest temperature, sea surface temperature has been uh, observed in the last 11,000 years. Uh, the lowest Arctic sea ice level in the last 1,000 years, uh, unprecedented melting of glaciers across the world, okay, and then um, ocean heat content has been also unprecedented in the last 18,000 years. Okay, and uh, here I just show you, uh, it has been observed the Arctic is warming much faster uh, over uh, this winter period, December, January, February, between 1960 to 2013, uh, the warming in the Arctic is much higher compared to the global average. At, let's say from, from zero to 60 degrees north compared to 60 to 90 degrees north, you can see that the 60 to 90 degrees north, the warming has much faster compared to the low latitude areas. Okay? Some people say that warming, Arctic is warming at about twice, but in fact, recent studies show that it's been warming higher than twice the global average. And then partly because of the ice albedo feedback. Uh, when ice melt, the albedo of ice, which is about 0.6 to 0.8, uh, changes to water, which has an albedo of about 5 to 7%. Uh, so because ice albedo feedback, there's a, a positive feedback mechanism. Uh, warming is going to be accelerated because of the ice albedo feedback. And uh, I will next show you a number of pictures of glaciers across the world. Uh, this first picture is the Athabasca glaciers, uh, not far from where we live. Uh, show you three pictures. First picture taken in 1917, next 1986, and 2014 was a picture that I took myself when I went to that glaciers. And you can see that these glaciers have melted uh, very significantly over the last century. And this is a uh, new glacier in Alaska, one of the most stunning pictures about glacier melt. Uh, first picture taken in 1941, and the uh, other picture taken in 2004, and you can see the drastic difference between these glaciers over a period of 60 years because of global warming impact. And two more pictures about uh, glaciers in North America, this uh, uh, Hudson Bay glaciers and Robson glacier located in the Canyon Rockies. Picture taken in the early 1900s compared to the picture in the early 2000s. You can see that these both glaciers have retreated significantly over the last century. Uh, you may question, I have been showing you all the glaciers in the Northern Hemisphere. How about glaciers in the Southern Hemisphere? And here I show you this, uh, Franz Joseph Glacier in New Zealand, uh, which we visited in 2011. Uh, based on picture we managed to take uh, in the past, uh, based on all those uh, 
poses uh, put in the glaciers, uh, it was, uh, glaciers was a lot more thicker than in the early 1900s uh, compared to recent years. This uh, was a picture we took in 2011. Uh, this was my daughter. And uh, compared to picture uh, in the past, you can see these glaciers in Southern Hemisphere has also retreated very significantly in the last century. Okay, uh, show you one more picture, one or two more pictures about sea ice. Uh, we have the first picture of the Arctic sea ice captured by the NASA's uh, sent, uh, satellite uh, called SSMI and SSMI. Uh, and this is the first picture ever taken in 1979. Uh, and look at the subsequent pictures of Arctic sea ice taken in 2003, 2007, 2012. Arctic sea ice has been declining uh, by about 7.4% per decade. So in the last few decades, it has declined by about 40%. Okay, so it's another uh, sign of global warming impact. And you can see that global warming impact is most prominent in the cryosphere. Okay? Uh, and some of these uh, pictures, all these I show you, uh, are published in this book called The Global Cryosphere. Uh, that uh, A lot of these are taken from this book that we have recently published in 2022. And uh, of course, uh, polar ice cap. If you look at the Greenland ice mass and the Arctic ice and the Antarctica ice mass, okay, uh, Greenland has been melting uh, a lot faster compared to Antarctic, uh, uh, like losing about a few hundred gigaton of ice per year. Okay, of course, that contributes to sea level rise because the ice melt, it causes the sea level to rise. So sea level has been rising in recent years about 3.3 millimeters per year, the present rate of sea level rise. Okay, uh, and based on projections, sea level can rise by about 330, 373 millimeters or up to 650 or 0.65 meters by the end of 21st century. Uh, especially, we cannot quite anticipate how fast will the sea level rise is going to increase. Okay. Uh, in the last century, in total, sea level has risen about 0.17 meters over the 20th century. And right now, it's uh, rising much faster because of the accelerated melting of these ice sheets. And uh, looking at permafrost, permafrost temperature in some of the northern European sites has also been increasing, has been rising. And when uh, permafrost start to melt, uh, the carbon that is frozen in permafrost is going to be released to the atmosphere, uh, which causes more warming, uh, which is, of course, an obvious positive feedback mechanism. Okay. So this is a book that we published uh, that will say a lot more about all these changes. So uh, I will now uh, give you uh, a, a case study that we did in the Canadian uh, prairies looking at this Athabasca River basins, uh, which is about, which has a size of about 230,000 uh, kilometers square, and look at how climate warming will impact the hydrology of these river basins. So uh, based on our study, uh, the black curve represents the annual hydrograph of Athabasca River basins. Uh, and these others are the projections of the change in the uh, annual hydrograph of this river basin under the impact of climate change. You can see that uh, there will be an uh, increase in winter runoff, early onset of spring snow melt, but at the expense of summer runoff. Some will be a lot drier because of global warming impact, because of early onset of spring snow melt. And summer is when you need a lot of water supply because a lot of crops, agriculture, rely on this sort of water supply in the summer. And of course, uh, you get some of this uh, uh, major flooding. Uh, here I show you three cases. Uh, the city of Calgary, about 
10 years ago was flooded uh, very extensively. 100,000 homes' basement were flooded. Uh, uh, evacuations for like uh, 100,000 people evacuated. And the estimate damage was like $5 billion. And New York City, 10, just over 10 years ago, was badly flooded. Uh, and here is Edmonton. Uh, we have uh, our main uh, highway was flooded. This is look a car here, okay? Uh, and we have snow in the month of July. <laughs> okay. And if you look at this recent extreme storm event, um, 1995 there was an extreme storm event that flooded 1,300 basements, and we call that a hundred year return flood, okay? And in 2004, we have another severe storm that flooded about over 3,600 basements. We call that to be a 200-year flood that on the average occurs supposed to be once every 200 years. And then 2012, we have another severe event that's about a 200-year flood. So these are 100-year, 200-year return period floods have been occurring about every 10 years. Okay, so something is changing. Extreme events are going to occur more frequently and greater severity. And I'm sure you know of the Hurricane Katrina and in recent years, the Hurricane Harvey that caused tremendous damage in the southern parts of the United States, okay? Uh, and it occurs usually in late summer uh, when the ocean is the warmest and uh, it could produce a very powerful thunderstorm when there's a low pressure center that uh, all the circulation zoom in the low pressure center pick up a lot of energy from the oceans when it's very warm, when it's the warmest, and produce some very, very severe hurricanes. And of course, uh, droughts. Um, we have uh, experienced quite some severe droughts uh, about 20 years ago, and on and off, every couple of years, we have some drought, not as severe as this, but this drought could cause billions of damage to the agricultural products and uh, forest products. And of course, forest fire. Uh, you probably know of forest fire in California especially, <laughs> and also not of California. In British Columbia, in Canada, we also have forest fire uh, just uh, in 2021. Okay? That, uh, some town has been evacuated uh, within hours. Okay, because of forest fire. And coastal erosions. As the sea level rises, yes, and more coastal erosions. And some small islands in the Pacific Ocean could be, may have to be abandoned eventually because of sea level rise. So what can we do? This is the last part of my talk. What can we do to try to address our climate crisis problem? Uh, there are a lot of talks, a lot of ideas, but we don't really know what really works well. Some say it should impose some carbon tax or emissions, uh, phase out certain kind of conventional transportation. For example, uh, instead of everybody driving their own car, SUV, you should try to uh, build all those public transport systems so that people can take public transport more than driving their own cars that emit a lot more CO2 and so on. And buildings, uh, codes, uh, you can install some more effective in insulation and power generation. Instead of using fossil fuel power generation uh, plants, uh, you should try to promote renewable energy such as hydro, uh, wind or, or solar energy. And uh, look at some of these uh, changes, especially in new energy sectors. Uh, global capacity new energy has been rising steadily for the last 20 years. Okay? As you can see from the diagram here. And the cost of producing this energy has been dropping very quickly, uh, like 40 to 80% in offshore wind or solar or onshore wind uh, power generation per megawatt hour. And those battery uh, to store those uh, power generated uh, cost of lithium ion pack battery has also been dropping like 10, 20% per year. Uh, 
And the, the kind of uh, ele- vehicles that we drive, the electric vehicles, sales has been going up as against the in, internal combustion engine vehicles, standard vehicles. So you can see that there's a, a contrasting trend in terms of uh, electric vehicle is rising, uh, ICE uh, vehicles are dropping the sales. And of course, you can install solar panel in buildings. Uh, so this, this was a picture I took in a church uh, near where I live. This was a picture I took in Germany last year, or the windmill. And this hybrid air, uh, air hy- clean air hybrid bus uh, that has been promoted, especially in Quebec. And also uh, this electric vehicle where you can plug in uh, and run on battery instead of fossil fuel. But of course, we cannot totally do away with carbon, uh, uh, with uh, fossil fuel, okay? And, and that's a fact of life for years to come. And so what, what we can do is to uh, introduce some carbon capture and storage facility. Uh, if you do that, you can reduce significantly the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions of natural gas and coal uh, by as much as 80, 90%. Uh, but you had to induce those uh, CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage facilities, uh, to, to capture the emissions. And so that you continue using this uh, fossil fuel, but we must uh, reduce emissions. And carbon capture capacity has been rising very quickly, uh, as you can see that uh, uh, based on the projections, in the next 10 years or so, uh, it could go up by over 500% okay, by carbon capture. Now, uh, just a few more slides to show you uh, key renewable energy. Okay? Uh, compared to 1980s, 1990, 2000, 2000 and 2020, you can see that uh, hydropower has been increasing, but not as fast compared to wind power and solar power, and especially uh, in, I think, in part of the United States and China, uh, are among the leaders in uh, promoting wind power and solar power. Okay? Uh, China right now is the, uh, the biggest hydropower producer in the world, okay? and uh, much more compared to North America. Okay? And wind power right now, United States and China are the leaders, so are the solar power, okay? compared to the past. Uh, there were very limited uh, renewable energy, let's say in the early 1980s and 1990s, but now uh, it's quite a different scene compared to the past. So we are doing something. Okay? Uh, solar, wind, and, and others uh, are rising fairly quickly. Uh, Hydropower is also increasing, but uh, at a more modest pace. Okay? So eventually, this uh, wind solar uh, could uh, overtake the hydropower production of energy. And uh, just two more slides about how we can effectively reduce uh, our carbon footprint uh, compared to three systems. A standard coal fire power plant to produce uh, 100 megajoule energy, of which only 34.8% energy are usable, the rest are becoming a heat waste. Uh, you need to burn about 2,580 grams of carbon, the low heat value coal, to produce uh, 34.8 megajoule of usable energy, or about 74.1 gram of carbon uh, per megajoule energy. You use a natural gas uh, fire power plant, the efficiency has gone up, uh, and the carbon footprint is reduced to about, from 74.1 gram carbon per megajoule of energy to 32.5 gram of carbon per megajoule energy. You use a high efficient gas fire water heater, you reduce the carbon footprint even further. So compare uh, about 18 gram of carbon uh, burn to produce one megawatt energy to 74.1 gram of carbon 
per megajoule energy. You can see that you can reduce the carbon footprint by about 75%, depending on the energy system you use. And uh, greenhouse emissions has been uh, decreasing. But if you look at this map here, uh, in North America, we are among the highest in terms of emission of greenhouse gas per capita, okay? compared to Europe. And compared to Asia and Africa, uh, we are to be blamed compared to other, many other countries. So uh, these are uh, various IPCC reports that have been published uh, that talk about uh, how climate change has impact us, vulnerability, adaptation, vulnerability. And, and, and th that's all of my talk today. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any question you have. Great. So, Brett, well, questions just pop up if there are any. Yes. Perfect. Are there any questions here in the room? I have one question. Um, I don't know about um, one thing I'm always, thank you for your talk. It's a very interesting, you know, collection of perspectives on all these components. Um, I'm always struck by the sea level rise numbers in that, you know, when they, have the projections of, or the measurements of what's occurred and what will be projected, the numbers don't seem large. You know, that's six inches, maybe half a meter, which is 18 inches or so or by the end of the century. But translating that into something that feels like a risk at the coastal level, I mean, how, how is that best communicated? You know, it's not intuitively obvious that if the sea level rises by a foot, you'll have it, like all kinds of coastal damage due to storms and things mm -hmm. like that. So is there a way that when we talk about these things in terms of these mean quantities, we kind of are minimizing the communication of the risk because, you know, six inches of rise isn't what causes the subway flooding in New York City, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. I think that CLRI's impact varies is very widely depending on where you're located. Uh, you are located in highland area. You don't worry about sea level rise at all. You never get up to your uh, your doorstep. Uh, but if you, are, you live in the coastal area, sea level rise could mean quite a bit, especially uh, during the wet months. Uh, the sea level is going to be higher than in the past, and, and then you're more likely to get flooding and also erosion problems because associated with sea level rise. I, I show one of the pictures there uh, because of the sea level rise. Uh, Erosion problem is going to be, but those are very hard to predict precisely, and, and that is the problem. Uh, but uh, there are some community that are already been threatened by sea level rise, as I show you the Marshall Island in somewhere in Pacific Ocean. Uh, they may have to eventually uh, abandon the whole community because they cannot just live in that kind of situations. So. Uh, uh, there have been some studies about sea level rise impact uh, and using different methods to estimate impact of sea level rise. But again, uh, there's a lot of uncertainties and I don't think we have the enough ability to, to really address those uncertainties. And, and I, I would say that uh, it's, I would say, more of a case and case uh, situation. You look at that locations and you look at the past, and you, uh, you should be able to make some projections. If sea level to rise, uh, let's say six inches to a foot, uh, you can do some model studies to see the impact. Yeah, it can be done more on a case by case study, but not in a global or regional perspective. That is a bit challenging. Uh, hi, hi, thank you, uh, Professor Gan, for a very uh, great overview of the topic. Uh, I have a question related to why you're showing uh, you have um, multiple scenarios of RCP 4.5, RCP 6, uh, mm -hmm. 8.5. So how certain or how likely are we, uh, perhaps I missed it, uh, I missed it, are we heading on to RCP 4.5 or are we getting 8.5? And then later, <laughs> 
Hang on, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, let me and go then, to the slide here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then later on, you were showing the, uh, we have the advance in technology, showing the, uh -huh. uh, the renewable energies fractions coming up very uh -huh. rapidly in the last few decades, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and the uh, carbon capturing and storage technology. So uh -huh. how, if you thinking about that, are we, are these new technology uh, helping us contributing to a less severe uh, scenario or there might be something more uh -huh. catastrophic uh -huh. occurring uh -huh. leading us to more 8.5 uh -huh. scenario? Uh -huh. Okay, uh, that's, that's a very, very uh, real question that uh, s somehow we, we have difficulty really give a definite answer. Um, so if you look at this slide here, uh, these are the five scenarios of the latest IPC report, uh, SSP 11.9 to SSP 8.5. And uh, as I say, based on my understanding, we are somewhere in the middle right now, uh, about SSP 2, 4.5. means to say that, that the, the rate of CO2 increase right now is about two parts per million. Okay? And so uh, we are about early 2020s, uh, now it's 410. If two parts per million per year for the next 80 years, you will bring our CO2 consumption into about 600 parts per million, unless we do some drastic reduction in CO2 emission. But that doesn't seem to be happening right now. We are still driving our SUV. We are still living the way we live and, and still burning fossil fuel. And uh, unless we can introduce those carbon capture facilities, as I show you in one of the slides, uh, we are not going to drastically reduce the CO2 concentration rise. And so, uh, based on that, uh, if you look at uh, this sort of projection here, SSP 2 4.5, we're going to be emitting about another 40 gigaton of CO2, uh, you know, for so many years. Okay, and, and then you can do a simple calculation to what is with the concentration of CO2. Okay, and it's about 2.1 gigaton of uh, carbon to lead to one parts per million of CO2 concentration increase. Uh, that's based on the simple calculations. And, and so uh, we talk about net zero here, which is about 2050s. That is only if you can achieve this, the most optimistic scenario is 1.9. Okay, then we say that uh, the radiative forcing of CO2 increases about 1.9 watts per meter square, but we are far from that. Right now we are more like 4.5, like about two and a half times as much. So uh, unless, uh, of course we are doing something, we are increasing the, the hydro, the wind, and the, but still, uh, we are still far short of the target, I, I would say. That, uh, uh, even though this renewable energy system are increasing, but if you look at it, hydropower produces about 15% of the global energy right now. 15%. It's still not a very big number. And, and uh, solar and wind is much less. In the past, about 2%, now might be about 10%. So we, we still have a long way to go. And how fast can we uh, promote this? Renewable energy system, I think there's quite a bit of challenge. Uh, we had to invest so much. We have to radically change the way we do things. And I think not many people are, are, are prepared to do that. And, and that's, that's what we are facing. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Are there any last questions? No? Great. All right, let's thank uh, Dan one more time. And, uh, thank you.